Lauren has also agreed to uh, make herself available to field some questions to our members. And at this point, I'll turn it over to Jolene to handle the Q&A. Thanks. Thanks, Lauren. And uh, thanks everyone who submitted a question. Um, it is very exciting and I'm very grateful that we can have some members here actually in person live with us today to ask those questions. So uh, the first one, we uh, turn it over to Karen Cohen, who is the managing partner at Embark Creative. Karen's business is one that has been hardest hit as they are in the uh, hospitality industry, but Karen has been doing a fantastic job staying resilient and we are honored that she could be with us today. So Karen, I'll turn it over to you. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Lauren, for everything you said. It's, it's incredibly inspirational and, and we appreciate you sharing that story with us. Um, I wanted to ask you, how has your leadership style changed following the impact that 9-11 had on Cantor Fitzgerald? I would say in one word, empathy. Empathy on a truly connective level that I began to find mattered for myself as a, as a leader and as a woman. I, I grew up in an era where we needed to be all things all the time and somehow show a bravado and a resilience that was impregnable. And part of that dogged um, tenacity served me well and continues to serve any of us well in positions of leadership. But what I found was that I was kind of gutted of so many of the tools I had before. So the opportunity to empathize with myself and my imperfections, and most importantly, to truly listen and understand and connect with my team and with my colleagues mattered the most. Don't just hear what people are saying, truly listen to what they're saying. You will see the tale of their trials and their fears and their hopes told between the lines of the words. It's a narrative practice really that combines the presentation of what you see with what you're hearing and doing it more effectively after 9-11 I think has made me a better leader and certainly a more adaptive one to the myriad of changes that not only go on in the economy but within the lives of our teams. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, our next question comes from Jack Glacken, who's the president of Today's Graphics. And, you know, Jack and, and his company were deemed an essential business through the pandemic, um, but that presented its own set of challenges. And Jack and his team have done a fantastic job uh, staying strong um, and, and displaying integrity through everything. So, Jack, thanks for being here, and I, I turn it over to you. Thank you, Jolene. Lauren, um, first of all, you're an amazing inspiration to all of us. I think that goes without saying, and I'm very honored to make, have some contact with you even virtually. Um, your, your recovery was relentless. And my question is this, um, what, what advice do you have or what message do you have for people to choose to like sweat the small stuff and maybe uh, worry about things that they can't control? Is there something that, we run into those kind of people all the time in business. Do you have something we can take back to them with? My hat's off to you, congratulations on your intrepid success in spite of everything the last half year has dealt us. Thank you, um, what I What I believe is that you're never not going to wanna sweat the small stuff in a sense. It's always there. It's there every time we roll out of bed. But what we do and what I found that I've done better through the years is train myself to take those kind of tactical problems and uh, nuisances and look at them within the context of the strategic or the longer term uh, stakeholder claims, or, which are both my own, uh, my own hopes for where we'll be, as well as those, and most importantly, those of the company and how we're best serving, um, serving our clients. So what I learned is you will crater yourself 
sweating the small stuff as it is. And then what you have to do is look beyond it, understand that's a bucket, that's a silo. It's gonna be there every day, some worse than others. Throw it in, understand it's there. It can percolate, but it doesn't mean you've got to eat from it. It doesn't mean you've got to uh, live it every day. You've got to, uh, one of the things in, in mission critical, uh, very tried and true, overly used uh, statements, one of the things people and companies have done is shortened and shortened and shortened their sights on the short-term profits, the short-term get them in the door, get them out the door. And right now that does matter more than ever to keep doors open in many ways, but we cannot lose sight of what our overall thesis and mission is. And if you do that effectively, then you will not sweat the small stuff as um, terribly. Okay, thank you, Lauren. Thank you. Uh, now joining us, we have Michelle Leff, who is the principal at 12th Street Catering. Uh, being in the hospitality industry, obviously, Michelle's business has also been deeply impacted. But Michelle, we recognize and we applaud all the pivots that you have made and the strength that you've been displaying. So thanks for joining us and I will turn the floor over to you. Lauren, thank you so much. What you've been through is incredible and uh, very impressive. I, I wonder where you get your strength. I, I find that to be uh, really admirable, that you have such a deep core of strength. Is there anything that you can share about where that comes from as you have approached this in your life? Well, first, I want to say thank you for your question. And um, being a huge consumer and connoisseur of baked goods, um, hopefully I'll get to visit your bakery one day. And um, I, I, I would say the following, um, what I believe matters is simply pushing forward and understanding that we will continually deal within a varied set of constraints. And what I learned in terms of my strength, I derived in certain part from my family and their ethos, but I'll tell you where I learned a lot of it. I, I love my country. I love my company. I believed in what our mission was. And I believe that as a citizen, we live in an extraordinary place. And every one of you today and every one of us has an opportunity to seek our dream, to fulfill our dreams with the enablement of um, the democracy that we have. And so for that, I'm gonna give it my best shot because uh, we deserve it. My children deserve it and our communities deserve it. So that's where I derive a lot of my, my strength from, the belief in my country, the belief in my community and in my mission. All right, our next question comes from uh, Dr. Brandy Nemchenko from Experience Chiropractic uh, who Dr. Brandy is always displaying such resilience and strength. So Dr. Brandy, thanks for being with us today and the floor is yours. Thanks, nice to see everybody. Um, Lauren, if you were here, I'd totally give you a hug. Um, but my question is, it sounds like you and I were raised in a similar household, uh, which at the time, again, was not very comforting, but it was really served us well in business to be really tough. So how do you uh, mix uh, having your children face tremendous setbacks and challenges and still be that soft place for them. How do you help them sit embracing the suck? So that was my question. That is probably the hardest thing of all for any of us to answer. Um, and uh, as a mom, you know, I commend you and, and all of your success. I would definitely say that the um, most challenging business I've had to ever manage is that of being a mother and all the foibles and mistakes that I've made. And to your point where, when you said you believe we have a similar um, background, it, it's hard then, right? I almost feel that um, perhaps there were moments where I was shown a little more softness than I ever let myself indulge in. And certainly um, that I've let my children indulge in. And so I've, I personally had a hard time balancing the notion of, when you know what lies ahead for these people, it is a scary thought. If you don't try to give them everything you can um, and all that advice, because you don't wanna leave it on the table, right? You don't wanna see them make the same mistakes that, that we made. And 
so what I've learned is that um, they're only ever going to take in so much and that when they get too much at one time, most of it just leaves their cerebellum, <laughs> especially if it comes from a mom's mouth. So what I do is, you know, I pick moments uh, where I can give an example of where I made a mistake and the kindness that I didn't indulge in for myself and that I hope they give themselves in making an error and realizing, I'm gonna go back to this word again, it was used today earlier, the pivot, and that the adaptability to changing is what's going to matter. And perhaps yours is the daughter that is um, has the marketing background in music. Unfortunate uh, major, which is uh, events management. And, yeah. and you know, that's a really tough business right now. I have a few friends that are involved in it. And I would say that she's obviously got your genes, so she's clever and smart, and she's got to turn around and rethink the business and how the delivery mechanism, and this goes back to, you know, Marshall McClellan medium is the message, right? The medium changes. Once we got to AB, you know, the notion of Zoom and Skype and conferencing became an everyday reality. So whatever our business looks like, the same goes for entertainment. And um, she's just going to have to be innovative and using her core skill set to find ways to deliver what her core mission is, right? Entertainment and relief and the joy of a melodic sound or, or laughter for an audience. And so um, I hope that that helps craft out um, what is the balance <laughs> of, you don't ever quite know, you gotta go with your gut and experience will teach you. Thank you so much. All right, and our last question uh, comes from Rick Elfrith, who is the partner at Today's Graphics. Rick, Thank the floor is yours. Thank you, Lauren. So inspiring, your story. As a business person, I'm curious what it took to rebuild the company after such a tragedy. With the loss of life and physical property and also the disruption to the business, there must also have been an enormous psychological, emotional aspect that needed to be addressed. What steps did the company take to rebuild at every level? I want to say thank you as being part of the crew that had me here today and has me here. And uh, I want to make really clear that what I did in terms of rebuilding the business was one step removed because I was not able to walk through the doors of Cantor Fitzgerald in the aftermath for until years later. And I did so in a very different fashion to support them um, and to help them rebuild. But I'll tell you what they did. Um, because it involved my husband's support and our support on the relief fund side to help support families who had lost a loved one in terms of ongoing paychecks and healthcare support. The, the company was able to garner through the government, much as many companies are now, in essence, a form of PPP, but what was in the form of loans. Um, what happened was a coalescing of community. Whatever business you're in, you've got brethren. They're your competitors, right, um, on most days. But when tragedy and difficulty strike, they became our closest allies. So Bear Stearns gave us space so we're able to physically relocate. And through the um, tenacity and ability of a lot of computer programmers in a remote location, saving the, the way in which to have a failover system effectively work for the bond markets, we were able to open back up. And what happened was our clients, the connection with our clients, the very people intensive business is what helped carry us through. Everybody in the business helped direct trades through Cantor. So we ran a debt and equity business in a myriad of fixed income products, mortgage-backed securities, CMOs, derivatives, and equities, primarily third-party market and the darker pools. And everybody threw their business to us. So we had a roof over our heads, people wanted to support us, and very importantly, um, people that had been with the firm in the past or had worked in associated businesses, raised their hands and said, I wanna be there to help. And my husband was working at a competitor at the time. His company had been hit and lost 78 people that day. And it was eventually bought by Cantor Fitzgerald, but at the time it remained separate. Well, 
Greg, my husband, went over, came to work, Tanner Fitzgerald, and in part for the business I ran, because he came from a similar line of the business, he helped rebuild it. And in a nutshell, what helped Cantor Fitzgerald rebuild and succeed was the love. The love we had for each other, the love that we had for the company, and, and really for our, our country. At that time, in what was you know, described as really you know, the cross hairs of terror and what became a series of additional terror events, we were all in essence fighting a common enemy. And so we doubled down and we decided to win. And I think it's that attitude is everything. Everybody sees it, your friends, your colleagues, and most importantly, your enemies. That's awesome, thank you. Thank you. All right, so um, that will wrap up our Q&A portion. Um, Lauren, thank you so much. It has been such an honor to have you with us. And thank you to everyone who submitted a question and Lauren, especially to you. Thank you all. Thank, thank you, you so Jolene much. Thank you, Jolene and Lauren. Thank you so very much.